Travis Bader, and this is the Silvercore Podcast. Silvercore has been providing its members with the skills and knowledge necessary to be confident and proficient in the outdoors for over 20 years, and we make it easier for people to deepen their connection to the natural world. If you enjoy the positive and educational content we provide, please let others know by sharing, commenting, and following so that you can join in on everything that Silvercore stands for. If you'd like to learn more about becoming a member of the Silvercore club and community, visit our website at silvercore.ca. Navy SEAL turned entrepreneur, founder of Half Face Blades, Warpaw Wine and Apparel Company, and an ammunition company starring in Hollywood blockbusters like Logan and Transformers, and when he isn't doing all of that, you'll find him in the backcountry hunting and fishing. Welcome to the Silvercore podcast, Andrew Arabito. Great to be here, brother. I've been looking forward to this one for a while. I do research before every single podcast, and I want to know what's going to bring the maximum value to the audience and to my guest. And doing research on you, I came to the very quick realization that... There is no possible way in a single podcast that will come close to conveying the positive and inspirational lessons that can be learned from your life experience thus far. So I'm going to take my best stab at it. You got a pretty storied history so far in life and I'm damn excited to see where it goes. Uh, Good to be here, brother. Let me know. uh, You ask the questions and I'll answer them and I'll probably go on a few uh, sidebars, which I generally do in podcasts (laughs) and catch myself and come back. So... Well, I was having a hard time thinking of where do we even start this thing? And I finally came down because I wanted, I try to have things in somewhat of an organized fashion because I'm like you, I'll go on sidebars all over the place. Yeah. It's kind of (laughs) hard for people to keep up. So, uh, I thought I would start with your tattoo, your recent tattoo you got in your back, the lion. Ah, yeah. That was a painful one. It's Uh, massive. Yeah. And you know, I kept my back open kind of specifically for getting that tattoo and I wanted to for a long time, mm-hmm. but, uh, you know how painful they are. And once you start, you kind of like, Oh man, like <sighs> why'd I start this? This is horrible, this pain. But, uh, I got, uh, the, I'm going to go back in on the 27th, 28th of this month and do another, you know, seven or eight hours, just fine tuning and making it darker and putting myself through a little more misery. Well, there's some special significance that you've been very public about on that tattoo, which is why I'm figured this is a place to start it. Otherwise I sure. probably wouldn't bring it up, but, uh, that was, uh, you come from a family with an artistic background and that was a, uh, if I'm not mistaken, a, a derived from a drawing and a painting that, uh, your father did. Yeah. Yeah. We've had it in my home for, I mean, since actually I'm not, you know, when I was seven, I'm trying to remember if it was on a house then or if somebody else had it. And after my father died, it, it may have been gifted back to my family. Mm. I, would, I would assume so because a lot of the early on paintings he did, you know, he sold for minor amounts or probably gave to friends here and there. But uh, it probably was gifted back. So it, it's been in my home, in my mom's home in Northern California for a long time. And it's a pretty big painting. It's probably, you know, close to three feet wide, you know, and three and a half to four feet tall. In my house, and it's just a big, big lion's head. It's a really beautiful painting, and I've always, you know, grew up looking at it. And I wanted to kind of give that that honor back and that ode back, and to my father, um, and kind of the significance of what a lion does mean um, as well. Did it take you a while to find the right artist to draw this one? Yeah, I'd been looking kind of all over, and some, you know, some artists are just good at different things, and I had. Uh, chosen a few different artists and just trying to line up the timing didn't work and I was like generally the artists I found were in a different state so it was about me trying to take the time to go fly somewhere and get it done and I was really wanting to find somebody here in San Diego so I could just really put those hours and that time in so I found a guy actually really interesting with him he lived in multiple countries um, from Germany to Turkey and and, uh, he was living here I contacted him and we lined it up and I went in and I had to cancel one day and the lady actually canceled all the days. And so I was like disappointed. And I contacted another guy cause I was like, Oh, you know, I, I had prepped, I like mentally prepped to have these, <laughs> you know, 20 plus hours on my back of pain. And once he mentally prepped and I got in there and like ordered burritos, went in, 
you know, I took, you know, one of the, the copies of the image to the guy and he's like, uh, and somebody else was in the, in the tattoo shop, like, no, it's my turn. And I was like, oh no, dude, it's my turn. <laughs> and they're like, oh, oh, we're sorry. We canceled your days. And I was like, okay, I'm going to find someone else. You don't get to do this, you know? And, and right. a piece like that, you know, guys are really good artists, really look forward to doing pieces like that mm. for people and really, um, show, uh, expressing they're the, they're the artists right expressing what they can do and, and showing people what they can do and how good of uh, tattooing they can do so uh, I was like alright and I I had actually ordered like food for the guy too you know, <laughs> like, to get dropped off and I left before the food got there so he had hit me up you know a few hours later and was like there's all this food here you know um, and I was like just eat it and give it away to the guys and yeah. I'm gonna find somebody else and he was like oh man so he kept hitting me up and he was like hey and he moved Okay. He to Colorado, and I was like, I'll find somebody else. And he kept hitting me up, and he was like, man, I'd really like to do it. I'm coming back to town to San Diego for a month. You know, can can I do it? And I was like, yeah, let's do it, man. So wow. I was, uh, met up with him, and we did five hours one day, seven hours the next day, and then four more days later, five hours. Four more days later, five hours. Man, and you just got a bit of touch-up now left. Hour yeah, two. it's you know it's all done. I'm gonna go. I'm I'm gonna do more than that. I'm gonna I like I want it really dark, and I want you know that shading. So I'll probably do you know like to do an hour that'd be really awesome but I'd probably do four or five six hours just <laughs> getting, at, getting after it so i'm just trying to get a uh, a grasp on what builds a fire within an indiv- within an individual to achieve a fraction of the things that you've been able to achieve in your life so far and i i think after doing my research i have a bit of an idea of some of the driving factors um I figured since you've openly talked about it in the past about, uh, losing your father and your brothers on a plane crash when you're, was it seven years old? Yeah. And they were heading to Alaska. Yeah. Well, they're coming uh, back, but they had, my dad had gone up there a few times interviewing, uh, these, these people that live in this little village and why they lived longer. And my dad was really one into the outdoors. He was an artist. Uh, he was a minister, um, real outdoors family. We were always, you know, camping, backpacking. And my older brothers love the outdoors, obviously, as well. And uh, he wanted them to just see how incredible Alaska was. So on that second or third, fourth trip, he had taken them up there so they could run around the woods and do some fishing as well as while he was out there interviewing these people. As a minister, I guess it was a... Faith played a big part of your, your yeah. upbringing? Yeah. Does it still? Yeah, I mean... Uh, I mean, I don't go to church as, as much as my mom would like me to, but, uh, I still, uh, I'm still a believer. Fair enough. Absolutely. I think I'm... the amount of times I've, you know, I've been saved overseas or, um, you know, and buddy has been saved and I don't know, just all the ups and downs in life. I think, um, I've got a good base of, of faith and, and value and, and good morals and, uh, good people and how I want to run my life. I find that's a common thread in people who are high achievers. They seem to have a strong grounding in whatever their background of faith might be, but they, uh, they have some sort of a guiding light within them that they can, uh, look towards, I guess, when things get tough or to kind of keep them on this, on sure. the straight and narrow on the well, path. Well, I mean, yeah, along with, with that, I you know it's like kind of living for others as well. So you, you know, you can better yourself and, and your immediate surroundings. And that's a big goal is, is, uh, people you love and people uh you care about a lot you want to support them and see them do well and see them prosper and career development and see them loved and know they're cared for and um and not like inward as much and obviously in the long run that helps you out too yeah i find that to be a bit of a, a life hack honestly the more you're able to be of service to others the more you're surrounding yourself with positive people and the more that you'll see residual um benefits from that either directly sure. or indirectly. Absolutely. So you were a youngster, you get a book, workout book on Navy SEALs and yeah. how old were you when that happened? Oh man, probably somewhere between sixth and seventh grade time frame. My mom's cousin, Ethan, uh, I, I don't know what drove him to do it. I don't know why he got that book. I, I think it was just interesting to him too. And uh, he's like, oh, Andy would enjoy this. So... I guess seventh grade, were you, uh, you're going to uh, Catholic school at the time? It wasn't, it was a Christian. Um, Christian school. Yeah. It was a Christian, a small Christian private school up in Northern California. 
And was this one that uh, you were able to see through to completion, or did you? Uh... I didn't get kicked out uh, ele- of any elementary schools. Just high schools? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm curious. I got kicked out of a couple high schools myself, and the yeah. a couple of them were uh, what Christian Brothers of Ireland high schools. I went to. Yeah, man, and, those there was some. You know, they think some of those schools were just a bit too strict for me. It wasn't, you know, I wasn't ever a bad kid. Just, you know, sneaking out was a lot of fun. And uh, BB gun wars, you know, you're getting a few fist fights here and there. And I guess uh, they don't like that. Yeah. I think the uh, first one was because it wasn't based on what I did. It was based on the fact that uh, apparently I had an us against them mentality. And uh, uh, didn't I like le- authority. <laughs> perhaps. And, uh, I <laughs> learned how to pick locks when I was in grade four. And That's awesome. so when I just looked at locks as a puzzle, right. And same with, it's uh, challenging. it is, it's a challenge, right. And it's, it's not that I want to do something nefarious once I'm in there. It's, right. it's just, it's a puzzle. Right. New and, lock, new right. puzzle. And, um, uh, same with computers. I was interested in that and I learned how to get into the back end of their, their system and Anyways, I made a master key to the school and, um, I, and I sold a couple copies of it to other people who wanted to be able to get into wherever. I don't know. Sure. I don't think anyone really did anything nefarious. Yeah. And, um, I changed some grades, never for myself, but for other people. And then, it's, um. It's very kind of you. Very kind of me. Very magnanimous. Like a good Samaritan. To totally. Honest. I mean, yeah. really, they should be. I should be rewarded for such efforts. That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> and, um, well, up until I locked them out of their own system and they had to back everything up off of tape drives or sorry, take it back off of tape drives and make up for several months worth of grades <laughs> that, uh, they said none of that would have really mattered if it wasn't for my, in a, like I, they wanted to know why I sold the keys to, and I t- wouldn't tell them. And, uh, well, so they I've said, seen them better. Right. Then so you, you show your, your loyalty very young. <laughs> well, they said you've got an us against them mentality. And since the brothers lived upstairs and they felt that their security was threatened and all the rest. And anyways, so. I've um, gotten suspended for not giving up names. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, um, I was looking at a number of things that kind of happened in your childhood. And I was like, you know, there's a f- couple of similarities all up until you go off and to decide to, that you want to be a Navy SEAL, which is, um, a little different path than myself and most people, uh, what was, what was sort of driving you there? Like I'm, when I'm looking at the difficulties and troubles that you must've been encountering as a youngster, both with the loss of your family members, as well as, uh, perhaps a little bit of oppositional defiance sort of, uh, mentality that seems to come out in the research I've done. I don't know if anybody yeah. has ever accused you of having ADHD, but, uh. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> when, when you talk about, uh, the artistic gene in your family, uh, being able to put pen to paper and your penmanship looks like you can barely terrible. read it. I'm terrible. like, you there's a lot of similarities in here that, that I can see <laughs> that perhaps makes a person very well suited in a sort of contrary sort of way to the military environment. Like why would somebody who's sort of oppositional defiant ADHD go into a system of very strict regimented structure and thrive? Right. And that, that was sort of an interesting piece for me on all of this. Do you have thoughts on that? Um, I mean, I think the, the challenge side of it, obviously there's that, that you, you, you have, right. Challenging yourself, um, being able to do what special operations do obviously requires, um, a lot to get there, which is all a challenge. And then it's also a lot of fun. So mm. I was like, well, I don't mind somebody telling me what to do if it's for a reason. And once I do that and I accomplish what they're demanding of me or asking of me to do. I can hit certain qualification levels and become better and better, better at some, at a goal, at a job mm. and being, having the end goal, being a protector, having the end goal going in and taking out bad dudes and the end goal also being with a really good brotherhood, um, is amazing. You did know, you so have I that? Knew there's an end goal. Did you have that feeling of brotherhood growing up? Uh, yeah, you know, my, my older brother's best friend, Steve Hamilton, really incredible dude. He became a youth pastor and he's a pastor now. Um, he, you know, became one of my older brothers. There was another guy, Scott Davis, who had, um, lived close to us, older fella, and he loved to rock climb and, 
Uh, he was an old sea urchin diver, an abalone diver in Mendocino, which is a tough, tough dude, and um, did tree working, and he kind of looked out for me, and I used to rock climb with him growing up after my brothers died all over the United States, and I had a lot of really good uh, uh, older buddies that, that looked out for me, mm. you know. You still climbing? You know, not not very much in a while. I climbed a bit when I was in the SEAL teams, and now Joshua Tree, and it helped start a, another lead climbing school on the West Coast here for guys that just with the right gear, one um, doing rock type stuff. And a lot of it was urban climbing and oil platform takeover climbing. If you didn't decide to go the, the military route, you didn't decide to go into SEALs, uh, what do you think, where was your life trajectory prior to that? Um, I probably wouldn't have, uh, I grew up skateboarding, BMXing. I probably would have continued down the route of skateboarding and tried to go pro. Yeah. At some point. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think that probably would have been, I was good, good at skateboarding. It's kind of neat that whatever it is that you're looking at, you're looking at pro level anyways, like that's in your sights. For a lot of people that never even crosses their mind as being something that would be, you know, you're going to be good at something, you got to be better at it than other people and, and why not like be the best at something. You know, I was in army cadets as a youngster and, you know, ADHD goofing around, you spend your whole summers off at a, uh. At a, um, an old base doing kid army cadet stuff. And I remember a, a captain came up to me once and he says, look at you're, you're coming up here, you're spending, you get off school, you spend two months up here and then you go back to school. You basically don't have a, have a break. Why would you come up here to goof around and yeah, not do your best or something? <laughs> right. And you know, everyone says, do your best, take it seriously. Right? For, but, if you're forced to, that's a little different story. You know? Right. And I'm like, okay, good point. He said, so. Wouldn't it suck if you went through this whole thing and failed and then you just wasted your entire summer? I'm like, yeah, it totally suck. So if you're not going to fail, why not be the best? I thought, yeah. huh. I'm going to get as much out of it as possible. Yeah. And for whatever reason that clicked with me, despite it being the same thing that everyone tends to say, um, what was, what was SEAL, tr- uh, I mean, everyone talks about selection, even though that's just like the very first part of things. I, I've heard you refer to that as enjoyable. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's like misery loves company, right? So you meet such incredible, uh, guys going through the same training and you build these friendships and it's like, I'm not going to quit. You're going to quit. And it's like competition, <laughs> you know what I mean? And yeah. not only is it competition when you're both just so miserable and you're just like, like, I'm not quitting. You're not quitting. Like, all right, dude, let's, let's roll. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's rad. It's a lot of fun training. What's the attrition like on attrition rate on that? Um, you know, it varies per class and depends kind of a little bit summer, winter class, winter classes, they use the cold more, just crushes people. And during the summer class, they, you know, physical beat downs is, is a bit more. And, um, you know, there's a class recently, and it also depends the time of war. And if there's a lot going on, they really need team guys. The classes are a lot bigger. So you have, mm. I think our class started, um, like last two, four, six, it started like 185, 186, and there's like 22 original guys that graduated that class. Wow. But, uh, there's some, there's a recent class. I'm not sure how many guys started, but I think there's like eight guys after Hell Week. Wow. So not that, you know, it could have been a little smaller class. Could have just, you know, some of the instructors just a little bit more mean or miserable <laughs> or, uh, you know, it's hard to tell. Maybe they just didn't get the quality of guys. That uh, My belief also is the last... 10 years, the quality of guys coming through is less. Yeah. You know, um, More tours. especially, yeah, guys who, you know, it, it became such a cool guy job with every movie and every book that every kid wanted to go do it. And, and that's a great thing for, um, you know, the purpose of getting more people to training. But mm. with that, they got, you know, they had to get more, I wouldn't say streamlined, but, um, more structured at training. And so it was like, there was somebody who wrote a book, like how to beat buds and stupid stuff like that. And they explained like on Fridays, <laughs> they can only beat you till, you know, 6 PM and they have to do paperwork. If they, the cra- class screws up more and they want to beat you in the surf for longer. And so with this information, it's hard to break someone's, uh, break someone's mind to the point where one, their only option is not to quit. If you already know that in three hours, they can't, they can't do anything more after three hours. Like you just hold out. Mm-hmm. You know, instead of getting to the point where it's like, I'm just not going to quit, um, they just hold out for those three hours, you know? So I yeah. think the qual- quality of guys it went down for a while. Now that there's not a lot going on, operational tempo is down. Um, 
well, I think the more recent couple years, there probably is a, a push to get more guys uh, with what the future holds. But there was a time frame where it was, um, you know, a bit of a time frame where they were like, hey, you know, guys aren't going a lot of, a ton of missions. We don't need a ton of seals. So they were willing to kind of not push classes, maybe not push classes as hard. So more guys went through. And mm. then now it's like, hey, you know, let, we can push really hard and only the best guys get through maybe. I think there's something to do in there. You know, it's not strict like that, like I said, but. I'm wondering about the mindset. When you went in, did you know that you're going to come out? Like in the gut, you're just like, yeah, there, there's no way I'm failing. And were you able to look around and identify other people? You're like, yeah, that, that person's not making it. I can tell. Uh, a few, not everybody. You know, there's definitely a few guys that uh, you meet. They, they're just, they're there for the right reasons. And they mm -hmm. turn for reasons. Like I didn't know any Navy SEALs before, you know, I've watched one or two, you know, you know, I've read some old books and stuff like that, but, um, you know, I, I didn't look at it like, like a pass or fail kind of thing. I looked at it like it was just training. Like you, you had to do it to become, you know, to get here. You had to mm. go through all this stuff. You had to do what I was told. You had to put out, you had, you just had to do it. Mm. And that's kind of a mentality I know a lot of the guys had. It wasn't like a quitting, wasn't, I don't know, it's kind of, people say quitting wasn't an option, but that's really what it was. It was. You just got to do it. And luckily, you know, in high school, I ran all the time and I, you know, was in cold water all the time and just very outdoorsman all the time. And I was lean, you know, and uh, strong. And I think, you know, if you go into training more physically fit, your body doesn't break down as faster and your body heals faster, right? So in training, a lot of it is just they break you down so physically that all you have left is your mental. And I think you can, if you have both, it's going to be easier on you. Mm. Your body, you know mm. what I mean. So if guys are recovering and you don't have time to recover, your body just breaks down. And then one, you're either failing uh, time stuff, and that paperwork can stack up, and then you just get the boot. Yeah. You know, or your body breaks down and you have an injury, and they get the boot or get rolled. So going into it really physically fit with the right, obviously mental mentality, you have just that. That was better. A lot of guys younger, you know, the younger guys in classes quit more. And then one, I, my belief is they haven't had as much life experience of ups and downs that they've been through. Mm. They've been a bit crushing, whether, you know, physically or just emotional, you know, putting out and pushing through lack of sleep, whether it's, you know, getting through stuff in college or just family stuff or whatever. So in general, the younger guys end up quitting more because at that moment of time, it's just they're in anguish, they're physically and mentally, you know, just so beat down that they just make that, you know, that that kind of irrational decision to quit. And then they're obviously after that so bummed and want to come back in two years or whatever. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of guys are like, well, it just wasn't for me. Like, okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Like, you know, I, I quit at... I, you know, after I quit after Hell Week, or you know, the the, the excuses a you the it excuses keeps. you hear are like, well, you know, they didn't realize that you know my legs were too the stretch fractures were just too much. Like if you have stretch fractures, they'll pull you out, they check you, and if they're they're bad, you get rolled. If you're a good dude, you get rolled. They heal, go through again. So mm. you, yeah, I've heard every excuse in the book. Yeah, it's funny. The um, you're you're talking about the younger folk. Pain is so relative. If you've never felt pain and you all of a sudden feel some, that's the worst thing in your life so far. Yeah. And then after they quit, they're, they're, you know, the pain of telling their dad they quit or their family and disappointment. They're like, oh. They got to live with that. Know. Yeah. And there's guys who go to the point where their legs are, you know, they have stress fracture in their femurs, not quitting and they can't walk and they get pulled out. Mm -hmm. The instructor's are like, that's what we want to see, not these injuries, but this can heal. Like your non-quit mentality that you're going to accomplish it and be a part of the team is what we want to see. Totally. I remember you reading know. the, I, I forget what it was in. It was like popular mechanics or something like this. It was, it was a weird place for it to be in, but I think they're talking about, um, the psychology of individuals during world war two. And they would have these old guys out there and with the young guys and in situations, let's say they're out at sea and they're without food and water for a bit of time. And they figured, you know, logically the young guys are going to do better. They're younger, they're healthier, they're stronger, but by and large, in all of these uh, arduous situations, the old guys were, were prevailing. And these are people who'd already seen a war before and sure. maybe their last divorce was worse than what they're going through right now. Yeah, right. Through a lot of stress, you know, mental stress and physical stress and just outlast. There's a saying, everyone's heard it, that which doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Well, all of that stress, I mean, 
some people will say, well, except for radiation poisoning, right? I mean, there's some exceptions there, but <laughs> right. overall. Finding a way to frame that stress in a positive fashion, I think is interesting. What would you do in order to be able to operate through these stressful situations and then come back in, in a healthy way? Uh, like training stuff or now, Both. you know what I mean? What's, uh, you like, know. Do you uh, employ those different, a different structure now? I don't, yeah, I think now, well, let's go back to then, you know, through those tough times then, let, let's say training, um, mm. and then let's encompass that into the SEAL teams and your training in the SEAL teams as well. Mm. And you, ha you have an end goal, right? You have an end goal. And a lot of that, you know, it's such a team-oriented thing, and they make sure that they make sure there's individually based tests and then there's team oriented tests and they want the mentality you versus them in training too. So you build that camaraderie with your buddies and work with them to like not undermine the instructors, but there's little things like, you know, we have like a 10 mile run and they were like, Hey, you can't put, um, you can't put, you know, padding on your, on your rucksacks. So the guys, we like, cut um cut some old wetsuits up and taped them on our bodies you know what i mean so yeah. at the end, end of the run we're doing push-ups and they're like everybody take their shirts off and they take and there's like five or six of us in the class you know and they're like <laughs> they lose their minds they make us get wet they call us back and they realize they never said you're not allowed to put padding on your body that's right so took us aside and they're like you guys you you got us okay you're good you guys are can go you know what i mean I love so, that thinking. And they like they like that. Think out of the box. Think a different way. You know, they they appreciate that. Those instructors think about how if I was an instructor going back and teaching those, I'd be like, oh, you got one up on. Them. <laughs> you know, that's really cool, and they like that. So then, it, you know, back then it's really about your your buddy next to you and your teammate. And if you quit, what if they're going to be put in such a stressful situation that? they can't handle it possibly and what if your mentality flows over to theirs and you know for a fact that their mentality is flowing over to you you know obviously you're stronger as a team um and you want your buddy to succeed wow you know? yeah yeah that's a very strong way of looking at it as much as they, as much as they try and build you up as a team and break you down as an individual the more you just lean into that team mentality yeah and you're part of it you 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 know you don't realize how big an impact, you know, you have on your buddies then, right? And I've thought about it now, and, and that really comes into now as well and how much of an impact you have on your friends. And I don't realize, a lot of people don't realize the impact you have on other individuals. Um, and I've I've come to a few points in my, in my life where I kind of just, you know, saw um, – the impact that such incredible impact that not only like growing up, you know, my buddies growing up looking out for me before I was in my buddies that were in that are out now. Um, guys like Dan Luna, uh, guys, the SEAL team buddies, Ryan Bates, um, thinking about my mom, thinking about some of my very close friends that have been in, you know, such an impact in me that I wouldn't be the guy I am today. I wouldn't be the man I am today. I wouldn't have, I would have given up before. Maybe not worked as hard or something could have possibly, a different path and I, I've you know come to some some pretty huge points in my life where I just like it really blew my mind the level of love that I've been given the level of faith that people have given and put on me the faith in me mm -hmm. um, that I'm like uh, I've just got to be so blessed and I that I should always try to recognize it and give that back and hope and like hope that I can be the level in which I, you know, feel blessed by the people I love that I could, I, I want to spend the rest of my life trying to show them that I can be that for them too. And hopefully I can. I think that's a really key concept too. Victor Frankl, the father of modern logotherapy wrote a book, Man's Search for, Easy, Man's Search for Meaning. And he says, uh, there is meaning in suffering. And there's ways to find meaning in suffering when people look at, look at how terrible things are for me. There is no reason for all of this suffering, but your ability, your ability to identify that. And I think a, one of the uh, research things I looked at, it says, uh, it was you, you said, if you can use adversity correctly, you can do great things. And that kind of struck with me It's basically the exact same thing that Viktor Frankl's saying, find a way to use that adversity. How do you use adversity correctly? Um, well, my, you know, one of my, one of my beliefs is, uh, you know, bad things happen to good and bad people alike. And sometimes there's no good reason. 
Mm-hmm. You know, and a lot of people search for a reason. Not that you can't, like we're talking about, take adversity and, you know, whether it gives you drive or just you're like, hey, that's really disappointing. That really sucks. That's really heartbreaking. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't need a reason, you know, I don't have to understand that bad things happen to good people and bad people alike. But uh, there can always be a lesson to teach yourself out of it, you know. So you got, what was the most difficult part of your, uh, your SEAL career? Um, I mean, losing buddies has got to be the most difficult, you know, uh, physical difficult. I mean, you can always, you know, work out, you know, work out more, be stronger, um, study harder. You can always do those things, but sometimes you obviously you would save your friends if you could and you, you cannot. Mm-hmm. It's one of those those things in life where you can't bring people back from the dead. You can be the best, absolutely. You could be the most stellar operator in the world, and you're still gonna lose close friends. That's that's what war does. There's, they just can't save everybody. Obviously, mm-hmm. um, the most you know, it's got to be the most rewarding, rewarding job in the world, and all the and also the most heartbreaking. You know, and that's the value of. The value of extremes, I guess, and the value of love and the value of friendship and the value of growth and the value of meaning, you know, mm. you live a, a gray life that you don't have a lot of extremes. I mean, what do you compare? How do you compare that? You know, how do you compare that level of love? How do you compare that level of hard work? You know, if you've been surrounded by people who don't work super hard and, and uh, then you go to the next job and they're like, and you, th- or, but they think they work hard and you go to the <laughs> next job and these people are like, you're, you know, you, this guy doesn't work hard and you think you do. Well, maybe that whole group you surrounded wor- yourself with just doesn't work hard. And this, and this next group really does. And I've had some of these not quite arguments with guys. I'm like, I was like, you know, I've worked hard my whole life. Like, like I'm, I, well, you haven't worked, you haven't worked with the guys I know. Right. You know, there's another level of hard. <laughs> yeah. You know. That's, I think it was Elon and uh, whoever the, the new CEO of Apple is, there was an article I read a while ago and they're talking about individuals who come into a high performing uh, environment. They hire a new person in, they come from a low performing environment, they're now in a high performing environment and how quickly that person will adapt to the culture of high performance. And likewise, that high performing individual who prides himself on their high performance when put into a low performing environment and workplace, how that person will just fit in with the low performing crowd unless they leave. If they, if they well, get it on I mean, themselves. Or you have, yeah. I mean, have you ever heard of guys that, you know, a new guy comes into work and he crushes it and the other guys are mad, you know. That's like, a union you know, thing. Ma- they're, make, they're making us look bad. That guy's making us look bad. Right. Well, man, step your game up. Or some, right. you know, because right. some people just have, some people aren't there just for the nine to five. Some people really love their job. Some people are good at it. Some people have natural ability, mm-hmm. you know, versus just, just, you know, some have this, some people just have a talent for it, whether it's a mm-hmm. physical attribute or a mental attribute growing up, because we all grew up different. Mm. I've heard it many times. Oh, that guy's making us look bad. Well, well, you better up your game. You know, that guy got a raise in three months and I didn't get one for eight. Well, I mean, try to sit there and recognize what they're doing different. You know, like maybe they just want to perform. Maybe they're being held back by everybody else. Um, I, I, it's a good thing to emulate those people, obviously. Maybe it's just the sad sacks that don't want to work harder. Um, <laughs> not that, it, listen, people get overlooked. There's there's people who work hard. They get a little overlooked here and there, whether it comes to financial gain. Uh, maybe there's not a position somebody can hop in, a leadership position or a responsibility position in a business mm. um, that they deserve. Just a, that position doesn't exist yet. Um, there are people that, can perform better finding those individuals and putting them in the right positions where they are challenged so they can keep going up is, is really ideal. Some people don't want, you know, they, they want what somebody else has, but they didn't, they don't want to put the time and effort in to get it. That, that is very often the case. People will look at the whole grass is greener on the other side, right? Well, look at what you have. How do I get there? Man, this is a lot of work. How do I just emulate you, steal from you, How cheat? How can I be better? How can I shortcut it? Right. Quite often you see those people who don't want right. to put that work in right. to try and shortcut it over. And, and that, even if you get overlooked, you know, like like I was saying, like sometimes you put the effort in and it doesn't happen. Mm. It doesn't mean you say, you know, you throw your arms up. It doesn't mean you give up on working that, doing that extra, you know, going that extra mile. 
Like, what, where's the self pride in your own? That's it. Your own, your own growth. Where's the self pride in your own career development? Where's the self pride in your own mental capacity and drive and honor or integrity? So I, I remember as an eighteen year old, I was, got a union job. I was working for an armored car company, and I was one of at the time one of the one of if not the youngest individuals hired by an armored car company up here in Canada. Now, how much they pay the armored car workers? Uh, if they didn't have young people coming to the game, they wouldn't have people working for them. And it was a really weird mindset because I would hustle. And I look at this, I'm like, well, geez, if I put an eight hour shift in, but I finish it in four, then I go to the beach, right? Then, then I'm out doing something else and okay. I get the same, same pay. And they would say, oh, slow down. This eight hour shift can be turned into 10 hours. We make overtime. This is where we make our money, right? I ended up starting other jobs in the time that I had off. Uh, so I'd do my four hours and I'd look for something else I could do. I started welding. Sure. I started, uh. Uh, gunsmithing and doing, doing other things. So it's so good. Career development, your own, your, your, your own personal growth. Right. And you, you are the one who drove your own personal growth, which is awesome. You can have individuals greater than you that uh, just have more life experience, that have that same drive that push you there, but not all the individuals have that. That's where you have guys like Jocko come in and he, you know, and he speaks on this all the time. And he's like, your individual growth, you're not going to always have somebody there cracking the whip showing you how to be better or saying this is, you know, do this, that you have to do it. And it's very easy to become a little bit slack on it if you don't have those people driving you, mm -hmm. you know, but for you, I mean, that's really, that's excellent. Well, you know, one thing that I've always kind of just, and I, and I haven't figured out the answer quite yet, but you hear a lot of people just saying, go out and crush it, keep driving, keep going, right? You can always work harder and it doesn't matter how hard you work in one area, the harder you work in one area, the less attention you're putting to another area. We all need rest, right? We all need to recover. Yeah. We all need physical and emotional and spiritual, and we have to somehow balance these things. But, uh, the mantra that seems to be pushed out is you have to work harder than the next person. You got to keep pushing and pushing. And I don't know if that's a, a sustainable sort of model. Maybe the work isn't always the best word to put it. You know, growth may be a better way to put it. And growth isn't always just physical labor. Growth isn't always just, um, you know, more hours at work either. You know, growth can be obviously your mental growth and learning capacity, whether it's, you know, listening to books on tape or I guess they're not on tape anymore. You just download them on your phone. But, um, <laughs> How old are we? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm getting up there. Um, you know what I mean? Um, totally not. A lot of that, have relationship growth. You know, um, um, spiritual growth, that's all part of that work harder, I guess. Work isn't always the best maybe term for it, but. Find, finding that balance and always striving for betterment. Yeah. Um, you now know, you. Mental health, mental health betterment, you know, not just work effort. What do you do for the mental health side? Cause I have a feeling you do what I do and that's go outside. Yeah. I love it, man. I, you know, I, I kind of have a thumb rule. Don't say no to any good new adventure. Yeah, I try to live live by that, and uh, I've been really blessed. This business itself, growing this, has has been obviously a blessing. With uh, mental health wise, is you know starting this kind of you know for fun, starting the knives. Like I was going to make knives for my seal buddies, and that kind of grew. And hired my roommate, hired my buddy. My one roommate, you know, was you know parking cars, um, civilian guy, and I was like, hey, like I need help, you know, and I think he probably took a pay cut. And we just started working in my backyard and hired my other buddy. I had my buddy I grew up in since ninth grade and he's my my manager now. And both the other guys that lived with me for 10 years, they both work here. Um, I created a little, you know, it was kind of back in the platoon. It was awesome. You're with your good close buddies all the time. So getting out, that kind of sucks. So everybody's, you know, everywhere out in the world with their families and their businesses and their, their careers. And you miss your buddies and you try to spend time with them. But, you know, creating a little shop here and, having your close friends around you and that was good mental health. We would run together and we hike together. We have, I mean, even now, like I've been looking for a bigger shop for a while. I want to build a little gym in my new shop, put a skate ramp on the back of it. Nice. So we can skate together and guys can lift together. And we have, we have like a whole ton of guys who like to camp and hike and we've kind of created a whole hiking crew. And we like, okay, let's find in this new hike this weekend is 20 miles. Oh, who's in, you know, and guys are like, oh, we're in. We get up at five in the morning and go do a big hike, a bunch of the crew. And, it's really created a cool little environment that's mentally healthy um, for myself, even personally, you know. And outside of that, 
this job affords the time and, and for me to go hunt and fish. And I have such an incredible team uh, that I spend a lot of time, you know, in the outdoors. I've seen people who come from a military background and they're ambitious individuals and they're doing a similar thing to what you're doing. And basically they're recreating their platoon within their business and they got their sure. buddies coming in. And quite often it's going to be in something that's in an area that they have an interest in or they know about. So I often see it in security fields. And I've seen a lot of relationships go awry because they are trying to recreate what they found in the military structure without having that same military structure. And one of them tries to assume a more superior role and maybe someone gets their, yeah. their nose at a joint. Have you experienced much of that? No, I don't micromanage and I kind of, you know, put guys in, in positions where they're capable and I, I do have an expectation of just working hard and, um, I haven't had, I've been blessed to not have, I got out of the military, you know, hundred percent through the VA disabled, you know, from injuries and I, I would have stayed in, you know, had there been the war kicking off and ISIS kicked off, I probably would have stayed in. Mm -hmm. Um, I kind of, when guys get out of the military and they go right back into something outside of that for a little more money with the same structure, I'm always like, why not just stay with the boys with the best group ever? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I didn't, I didn't want, I don't want to be in that same structure, the same environment, you know, the environment, the awesome part of it with your buddies all the time is great. I don't want to be in that same kind of, I don't know if it's too structured mm. or, you know, it's not too structured. I think you just get a lot of, you know, well, politics and stuff like that. So yeah. you don't really have politics in my shop. So you sustained a few injuries actually, and that was, you ended up leaving on a hundred percent disability, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. My, I was you know supposed to do med board and I ended up just doing my EOS and not doing the med board. So I went to try to do the med board again after I got out and they were like, no, you're already out. So I have all my paperwork for my medical retirements been in for years and it's just, you know, the Navy has to go like, VA paperwork has to go back to the Navy and then they have to look at it and be like, oh yeah, we should have med boarded you. We were going to, but we didn't for, you know, so it's just a, it's a long process. What were those injuries? I know you held up your hand there, but you had more than one, didn't you? Yeah. I mean, I mean, from, I don't know, falling off roofs and breaking my nose and broke my left leg and, you know, my, all my fingers got smashed in a steel ship hatch. The wind from a black hot caught the door and slammed me in. And I got my leg out the door, put my hand on the wall, pulled my leg out of the door as it was slamming and caught all my fingers on the hinge side and broke all those. And Damn. I'd broken these fingers on my right hand. Just, you know, I used to fight probably a little too much. Yeah, that was something else I picked up. It looked like, uh, and, and that's where I started twigging into the possible ODD, oppositional defiance, <laughs> AD, ADHD sort of thing. Um, that fight's great when you're a SEAL. It uh, doesn't jive as well when you're outside, right? The civilian yeah, environment. Yeah, I mean, you, you get in trouble a bit more when you're in, in the teams here and there, you know, but it really depends, depends when and how you're fighting. You're not going out drunk, just picking fights at the bars, you know mm. what I mean? Generally, if you're out, you know, somewhere four or five people, people really, you know, if they find out if you're on a trip and they found out you're, you know, a team guy of some sort, they end up getting chips on their shoulders and guys like to uh, test their might. Yeah, I hear you. It's funny, funny how that works. Well, you're a tough guy, huh? Well, I bet you if I can, if I can take you on, that must make me a tough guy. You're like, okay, buddy. <laughs> See how this goes. Um, <laughs> There was something about uh, a beehive or bee stings. What was this one about? Oh uh, man, I got I got blown off this roof in Afghanistan, and uh, I come flying off a roof, like kind of half with it. I have my gun in my hand, but I'm kind of angled out into the compound, and I pretty much in my mind, I don't know, for a split second, thinking maybe if I run with my legs like this and I hit, I can run it out like a cartoon <laughs> or something. It didn't happen. I just remember hitting and my gun hit and I just and pulled my arms down like that. So my face went forward and I hit like this little pile of logs and, you know, cut my face open here. like broke my nose again and got knocked out. But my gear slid up my back. So my lower back was showing and there's these bumblebees. There's just monster <laughs> bumblebees that live in the walls over there. And they just attacked my back too while I was knocked out and just stung my back a bunch. <laughs> So it took a minute and my buddies were like, all right, well, I'm not getting stung. So I'm just going to wait till Beto wakes up, you know? So pretty soon that <laughs> I kind of get nudged and I start getting up and, uh, um, hi, Crow. And, uh, Brad Kavner's like, Hey dude, you good? And I'm like, yeah, man, I'm good. Uh, 
man, it's some, I think I broke my back, man. My back hurts really bad. <laughs> he was like, no, man, you should have seen the amount of bees on there, though. You know? <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, it's just bee stings. He's like, yeah, He's like, you're allergic. I'm like, I don't, I don't think so. I've never been stung by these monster bumblebees in the walls in Afghanistan. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I'll be all right. So, yeah, get a little quick little cleanup and back at it. Uh, God love your mate, sir. Ah, he'll be okay. <laughs> I'm not going in there to get those bees <laughs> off him. Yeah, he was like, you know, he was like leaning back like this, like pushing me with his foot. You good, dude? I'm like, Are there <laughs> still bees around? He's like, no. I was like, you could have just, you know, woke me up normal. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So you're out and you decide, hey, I want to, I want to be a businessman. I want to be an entrepreneur. You just took a stab at it or if you had a little bit of, uh, there's another, another team guy that wanted to start a brewery and distillery. Um, uh, and I, he was getting out around the same time and I was like, cool, man. And interesting enough before when I hurt my hand, I was, you know, about nine months before my end of active service and my, I just had to do all this physical therapy and stuff. So my master chief was like, well, you're going to, you know, make a lot of your own schedule. And I was like, man, you know, I was like, distilling would be cool. So he, you know, he was like, cool, you know, you have all this leave saved up. So you want to take leave and start going to distilling school. So I went to Chicago and, um, I forgot where else I went to some, you know, two week distilling courses. So another guy wanted to do a brewery. So I was like, all right, well, let's combine forces. So immediately when I got out, I went into doing that and, uh, ended up having some really dishonest, uh, business partners there that, uh, just, you know, really dishonest people. And, uh, eventually just pulled away from that and spent a long time in court, uh, with that whole thing. But it's I was worst. also doing the work. Oh man, it's crazy. Like, you know, you get, you, you trust people so much in the SEAL teams and you get out and like people yeah. just let's see. I don't know. And then you're stuck in the legal battle and that's a whole different ballpark. Yeah, gotta, and that's not yeah, a game where you can just reach out and punch them. No, I'd be, I mean, that, that'd be ideal. The punch it. Yeah, the least, exactly. You know, but, um, yeah. So dealing with that and then I've, you know, met some good people up in LA and I was doing some military advising and stuff like that. And, while I was doing that, I met a guy, Garrett Warren. He's a stunt director uh, and second unit director as well. Did Avatar, Logan, like the first Avatar. I mean, his his uh, work up there as a stunt man, a stunt director, and, and and director is like absolutely incredible. So made really good good friends with him. One of my best friends. So when stuff came up, I'd go work up there. It's not something I want to. Um, I don't want to live in L.A. I don't want to hustle like mm-hmm. that just for a penny. That you know, I spend ninety percent of that penny. You know living yep. in the city so that's uh, but i did enjoy working with good people up there so that's i was kind of doing that and then i was like man you know to get back in the outdoors i started kind of hunting again and getting into that and i was like man like you know i know knives i made some knives with my older brothers i grew up with knives using them you know wilderness survival stuff and uh the knives and the teams and i was like man i should just make some knives for my buddies that are still active duty and some of my friends. And so I just started studying in, you know, what's the best steel nowadays for what purpose, you know, looking at grinders, just doing that whole process and, um, kind of just, you know, got what I needed and started doing stuff under the awning in my backyard and, um, just grew from there. What kind of grinders are you using? Just personal. Oh man. I mean, I have a couple of my first, my first grinder was just a Beaumont KMG. Yeah. I still have it. It's in back. They're good. Yeah. Yeah, good little grinder. I have two of those that we do a lot of. We still hand grind probably forty percent of our knives. So um, wow, that and I have a lot of Travis Wirtz. Uh, I was going to ask about grinders. them. They're pretty yeah, good. I have about six or seven. They're amazing. Yeah, and Travis is a good guy, man. Yeah, uh, like he's like this engineer minded. He's just a, he's just a very intelligent guy. So I have yeah, a bunch of those, a... and I forgot what else. I have two others. And I forgot what their names are. Any beaters? No. No. Nope, I mean, no they're, all, they're all, they all get, they all get a lot of work on them. Yeah. I was looking at a beater only cause that shares my same last name, but the Travis Wirtz, I've had some back and forth with him and I mean, they look yeah. good. I maybe off air, yeah, I'll pick your brain good. a little beaters bit. Those are good. Yeah. Yeah. Those are, um, I mean, they're supposed to be good. There's a lot of, a lot of good machines out there. So what did you, what was sort of the biggest takeaway from the first business venture that didn't quite go out the way you wanted that you've been able to apply to your future business ventures? Um, you know, one of the biggest things I saw originally when I went in the brewer distillery is people just paying themselves before we were successful. Mm. You know what I mean? And, um, like, what are you doing? Like money needs to go back in that business. There's no, there's no promise you're going to be successful. There's no promise you're not going to 
um, you know, you're going to make the best. There's no problem. There's always people better. There's always people, you know, it's good to have good ideas and bounce those ideas off smarter people and better people. And then you got to really enjoy what you do and you want to learn everything about it and do really good at it. You know, you can't just be like, well, this is the best thing. It's going to, it's going to take off. It's going to do good no matter what. Like, and then, you know, like I said, like we're talking about one of the biggest things take back was keep that money in the business, you know, Mm. keep growing it, keep just putting that back in, putting that back in, putting it into a team, putting it into your buddies, you know, even to this day, uh, we have a few cool little programs we do in my shop where we work on some just really beautiful one-off, you know, originally, so we take custom orders, obviously, um, Mm -hmm. people email and they talk to Kelsey and they, what do you want? Blah, blah, blah. We get into it and they, but we don't, we used to do these really incredible one-off pieces for people. And then we'd see six or months later, a year later, two years later, they'd go for 20, 30,000 bucks. And I was like, wow, I sold that for two grand. You know what I mean? And and that's awesome for them. I'm really happy for them. But it kind of came to a point where we're like, Hey, we need to do these ones in house and we need to, Fair it away whether we auction it or do that limited edition sticker and a giveaway where that money can come back into the guys um, and and make these guys' lives better. Obviously, if somebody, if you know, we sold a hundred dollar sticker, you know, the, all those stickers are worth more now too. So not only can you resell that sticker for a hundred bucks, you can make twenty bucks off or forty bucks mm-hmm. off or fifty bucks off of it. And the one person who got that tomahawk can make twenty five thousand. Off it. So wow. everybody wins in the end, and that money comes back. So when we do these one-offs, and I have my main top guys, we say, "Hey, let's do the, let's do another project. Let's work on this." So those guys will work on stuff throughout while we're working on everything else. You know, let's say it goes for twenty-five grand. I take ten percent of that, and I pull cash out. And, you know, hook the guys up. We've worked on it. Cool little thing there. And then we take twenty percent for f- charities from there, and then the rest goes into account, and we pay for bonuses, pay half of everybody's health care in the shop with that. Nice. Um, you know, a movie comes out, we rent the theater out and everybody goes and watches a movie together. Uh, we have money put aside for, you know, if somebody gets in a little car wreck and needs help there, a new vehicle, we need to help somebody get a little down payment to get a better interest rate. Um, you know, we, I want that going back to the guys and put value, more value than just their paycheck into the business they're working in, you know? That's pretty amazing. Like you've you've done a lot to create a a strong team culture within your company, and it seems like uh, you have a bit of a guiding light. And I I look at people who have businesses that don't kind of know what their value proposition is. They can't say it in a very short and succinct way, or they don't have something that uh, they can use to measure whether they. Like for example, if if your guiding light is to provide uh, top quality and this type of knife or whatever it might be, anything that doesn't meet that threshold, you don't even have to look at it. It's easy. It's out. You have a very yeah. clear kind of path. What is your sort of north star with with Half Face? Uh, honestly, providing provide you know outside of the obvious of of providing you know quality tools. Um, to people and things that, you know, and tools that are really meaningful, you know, like using people's ashes and stuff. But as an overall arching, you know, company, I want to provide, uh, I want to provide a good life, you know, for these guys who work here. I want to prov- provide a good life for myself. I want to provide a good life for my fans, my friends and my family and my mother and my sister and be able to be uh, a huge asset in the people I love uh, in their lives. And I want these guys to be able, I want these guys to be able to, you know, career development, you know, there's, there's not a lot of positions right now for guys to step up in, mm. in, in the shop, but they, I still want them. So even in my shop career development wise, if guy, you know, similar in the teams, I went to like free running schools and cool stuff like that. And it was like, Hey, if That's this is going to cool. help you be a better at your job in here, I'm like, you know, go take a class and we'll pay for it. You know, like you guys, you know, some of the guys, you don't want to learn scuba diving. So I'm like, all right, cool. Let's, I'll pay for you to learn scuba diving. And that's even outside work. It's not making you better work, but it's, it's really a uh, <laughs> personal growth. Yeah. You know, and what's it cost? You know, a thousand bucks to have, you know, here's a thousand dollar bonus. I'm going to pay for you to go to scuba diving. That's if guys want to do that. Awesome. Guys, you know, that's I amazing. These too. guys to enjoy life. Yeah. You know, I don't want to just some, some, you know, it's an, it's an already an awesome shop, but what more can you do, you know, to be happy and develop your own, own self and enjoy life outside of work? You know, they, 
oftentimes it's quoted that money is the root of all evil. And I think the correct quote was, uh, the covetous love of money is the, uh, root of evil. I am in agreement. I think money can buy time to an extent, right? Mm. So I have time, you know, these guys have time, um, with that money that we work, uh, we work and make it goes back in the business. We have a team. I'm able to, you know, support my mom a little more. I'm able to go on these hunting trips. I'm able to buy some time with those I love the most. So I'm not stuck, you know, driving two and a half hours to work, eight hours, two and a half hours home, like in LA for that extra buck. But where's my time in the gym? Where's my time outside? Where's my time with my kids? Where's my time with my family? You know, stuff like that. So how old that, are your kids? That, I'm, I'm saying my kids as in general, I don't have any. Okay. Okay. Cause I didn't think, yeah. I was like, Oh no, 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 no. Bing. No, just, you know, overall arching of gotcha, what, what gotcha. people to look at, you know, time with those you love has got to be the most valuable thing we have. I, I see that as the thing that I, I really respect in people who can identify that as their number one driver. I, I've always had that as a driver for myself and in my businesses. I don't care about the money. Money will come if you provide a good quality product and you're right. providing a good service and it's desirable by yep. people. I care about the adventure of building it and the ability to spend my days and my time in a way that's going to be enjoyable. And absolutely. And those and people look around at that, me. You know, look at, like we talked about, um, how you don't quite understand uh, what you do for others and impression you have on others, like just with half face alone, it's a tool at the end of the day for me. Mm. It's a tool. And we've built so many cool friendships and relationships through just knives. You know what I mean? Uh, with the HFB enthusiast group gets together and they hunt every year and they bring guys in and help them learn how to shoot and cut up animals and like, uh, fishing. And these guys have built outside. They've just supported half us. have so much gratitude. That's the other thing you got to have. I have so much gratitude. And they're like, look what you've done. And I'm like me, look what you guys done. You valued this company right. so much and put much effort and time and money. And you've built, you know, you've built friendships with other people that you share in common with that love this brand, that support this brand too. And look at what you're doing for the guys in my shop. So we have so much gratitude. It's so cool to see this, this, this second, you know, the second group of people that support the brand becoming friends and raising money for people and raising money for foundations. And a wow. guy gets in trouble, they help him. A guy can't get a knife and they give him a knife and they buy and sell and trade and create this, um, you know, this whole other group of excellence and friendship and, and just, just wow. from a, a tool company. How did half these, oh, go on, sorry. No, I was just saying like, I gotta have so much gratitude for that. And for yeah. That. Totally. How, how did you come up with the name Half Face Blades? Um, one, I used to paint my face half black you know, on a few ops overseas. Um, and then, uh, you know, speak softly and carry a big stick. And then see another, that's the other half. Gotcha. It might not be a big stick, you know, but a lot of people, when you first <laughs> get to know somebody, you know just a little bit of them and you get to know their other half. And, you know, not that it's a bad half or a violent half, it doesn't have to be that, but, you know, that's what the you duality. Know, that's Correct. Yeah, sort of the yin, the yang. Like the big stick one, what Dr. Seuss say? I've heard there's troubles of more than one kind. Some come from ahead, some come from behind, but I've got a big stick. I'm already, you see, now my troubles are going to have troubles with me. I don't know. That's always so going to stuck so with good. me. Um, so you just came back from a fishing trip. I'm curious about that one. I came back from That's hunting cool. my, my first hunt for Axis deer in, in the States oh, yeah. and, and uh, did a little bit of spear fishing. I want to hear about your spear fishing. That was a great trip. There's a, a company, Kinetic Spearfishing. Um, a guy is still active duty. Uh, him and another guy it just got out, moved to uh, Montana, and they build really, really cool, really killer fishing uh, spear guns. Mm. And, and the guy himself is like a really, really incredible. I mean, you know, if I'm spearfishing for a while, I get some good dives in for some good time. But, uh, I mean, this trip, he was diving, you know, 70, 80 feet. Yeah. You know, down. And I, I think my longest, my deepest dive was probably 45 or so. And I did, That's good. I did like a 43 for a minute. My longest one, I did like a 20 foot for two minutes and nine seconds, you know. That's good. But, uh, the bigger anim, you know, the bigger fish are a little deeper. Um, really incredible trip. You know, there's another guy, Dave. He retired, another team guy, went on the trip. Um, there was some random guys that spearfished that the guy Blake knows from around the country, from Texas, another guy from here. Uh, that the guy from Northern California as well that flew in. We met and flew down to Panama 
off of Panama, there's little islands. There's a um, Cobia, which is a, a state where it's a protected area. That's we didn't dive there. Obviously, it's not allowed. <laughs> but right. you go past that way out to uh, uh, a little island, tiny, little, tiny little island. No one lives there whatsoever. It's I don't know how many acres, but you can drive around it. You know, in about thirty minutes. Um, such an incredible place, and you know, we went out there. They had a whole whole crew, three boats. You know, the the locals that drove the boats, and the, they some of those guys dive and. We catch the fish during the day, or dive for lobster, and cook them at night, and start again the next day. Wow, really incredible! That saw, you know, weird. saw a bunch of sharks. They're all small ones. One of the guys was diving, and he, I guess, he just kind of felt like something was looking at him, and he was down at like thirty feet and turned. And there was a twelve foot uh, hammerhead, <laughs> and it was kind of following him. And it came, it turned, went by him, it turned, came straight toward him, then took off and went away. And, uh, I was diving over my buddy, and uh, maybe a four and a half foot uh, white tip was following him, and it was getting a little close. So he went. And poked it on the head and it took off and <laughs> but i mean i diving you know I, I don't dive a whole lot here but getting out and diving again i've done it quite a bit in the past which i really loved like diving in fiji and diving in Morea, a little island off tahiti uh man that is something i dove off via Cas and calabra off of puerto rico what incredible like i fall in love with it again every time i go you know man. but i am scared of sharks the entire time are you really absolutely yeah like always in the back of the head, looking over your shoulder every time you go down there? Always, like every two seconds. <laughs> just watched a clip of somebody uh, jumping in the water and it, I think it was a great white just came out and they're oh, yeah, coming Australia. up back of the boat. Yeah, you saw that one, eh? Yeah. But No thanks. Yeah, no. <laughs> I I just turn my brain off when I'm down there about the sharks and I just assume that if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. It's kind of like bears. Gonna, I just assume it's going to happen to somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> And you know what, with that mindset, whatever it is, it usually does, doesn't it? I don't know what it is. You put that vibe so, out there. Yeah. I don't know, man. It's, yeah. I mean, I'd rather be out, like I'm more comfortable with a rifle out in the middle of bear country than, Yeah, you know, a spear gun with an animal that weighs way more than a bear and that's all you got. Like mm -hmm. one shot with a spear gun just pisses it off. At least with <laughs> a good shot with a big rifle is going down with a yep. bear. You know what I mean? You got any hunts lined up this year? Um, yeah, caribou in the fall with my buddy Matt DeLuca lives in Anchorage, just an incredible outdoorsman, one of my best friends now. Last two years, I've been going up to Alaska with him and going out and, and uh, hunting nine, ten days out and just way back country in the Alaskan range. Really incredible, man. It's Alaska's one of my favorite places on earth. Thinking about the Alaska one, it kind of brings us full circle to where we were talking about at the beginning. Uh, if I understand correctly, there's a fellow in a village there that was having dreams and he was, yeah. did you ever find out what those dreams were about or what, what he was? So, uh, the, so the guy was, uh, Manilik and, um, that's who my dad was up there interviewing that village. I don't think he was alive and I think he had died probably previous before my dad went up there, but he was having these visions of just how to live better and healthier. And that village was living, you know, 20 years longer. And that was kind of a interesting thing up there. Why, you know, why all these villages, you know, I, I'm not sure what the mortality rate was, not mortality, but, you know, old age dying rate, mm. that's mortality rate, I can't think, but it was like, um, you know, 50 to 60s and these people were, you know, 70 to 80s and I want to do a little documentary on that, which is kind of cool, but I haven't been out there out in the middle of nowhere where that little village was, mm. it's up on the coast somewhere, you know, one, one of the biggest goals I have, which I wanted to do it, you know, last year wasn't able to, uh, this year, sorry about that, of course dude. Okay. All good. Um, this year, I'm not sure if I'll have time, um, but I want to get the prop off the airplane that's up in the mountains, which would be really cool to do. Still up there, eh? Yeah, still up there. I went up there. Uh, I go up in June. There's a really good, uh, it's a 51C3 now called Arctic Guardian. Mm. This guy, James Drayton, runs it. I go up. Uh, they invited me up last year and kind of helped set up a carbine course. So all the guys like law enforcement, FBI, SWAT, you know, the army guys up there, it's, uh, they're all invited for this one day and there's, we set up some sniper stuff, carbine and pistol and it's a competition and, and there's a bunch of companies get involved and give away gear to winners and everybody involved and it supports all those guys up there. So we're, we do that every year. Um, wow. It's called the Arct Arctic Guardian. If guys want to look it up, really cool. Um, they always need as much support as possible. Totally. So I'm going up there again. That's in June. We went last June. We went out to see if we could see the crash site, but it was still covered in snow. So I think I'm going to have to go later in the year, try to get that. Well, I'll get some links up, of course, to your business 
and your companies and social oh. where people can find out more and Arctic Guardian. I'm going to have to look that up and see about yeah. putting some. Really uh, good, really good guys, really good people. And it's just a good program. I know we kind of jumped around a little bit here, but is there anything that we haven't talked about that we should talk about? I don't know, man. You know, <laughs> as long as we're having business, fun. Life, business. Yeah. I mean, we got, you know, I got the ammo company with my very close friend, Ryan, Ryan Bates, really good. Just one of my best friends ever, uh, working on that, working on a new, with another guy, Bill Kent, retired team guy and Johnny LeBlanc, another retired team guy working on a new, um, kind of, uh, search engine for ammo as well. That's kind of, there's a, you know, there's manufacturers and there's buying groups and then there's two middlemen and then there's a wholesaler and retailers and there's just, people always want their cut and people at the end of the day don't get the best pricing. And so we're working on a way to get people closer to a manufacturer and better pricing. Oh, that's yeah. brilliant. That's sort of like yeah. the, the shark tank guy who did it with, uh, medicine. Have you heard of that one? Uh, uh. I, so somebody here, I'm sure will correct me if I get this totally off base, but from my understanding, one of the guys from Shark Tank, uh, has set up a, um, pharmaceutical supply company where they have relationships with the manufacturers and they only charge whatever that drug is plus whatever percent. It's like plus 4%, right? Whatever it is. Incredible for people. Massive you know. for the world. Massive. In Absolutely. The barrier to entry. And that's how it should be. That's how it should be. Like. You know, <clears throat> not that, you know, there's wholesalers and retailers, they got to have some, you know, and you got to have, there's just been, you know, with the ammo company, you've had just, you know, from manufacturers and there's certain people that only have those relationships and they keep them and they'll come in with six, seven, eight million bucks and then they'll hold it and they'll release some and then they'll really just control, try to control everything. And they're, you know, you have, and then you have the guys selling and you have like four people between these to the, even the retailer that want their, you know, two cents to five cents. And now the reacher is the one with the brick and mortar, with the insurance, yep. with the employees. And now he needs really to make, you know, you know, 10, 15 cents around. And, and now he can't charge that because the, the customer itself, the guy needing the ammo to shoot it is like, I can't pay that much. Right. You know, so we, we're working on this. This way that guys get to skip a few middlemen, greedy middlemen, <laughs> you know. I, I was hearing you talk about, and it was, it was an interesting perspective. If you own your own business, you're going to have people with their hand out and people are always going to be like, well, what can you do for us? We've got a charity, we've got this, we've got whatever it might be. We've got a special interest group. And you started to take a little bit of a different approach, at least at the beginning of your, of your business and how you dealt with this. Can you tell me a bit about that? Um, are you talking about like. Wow, like every other day starting out, like foundations just wanted free stuff, which, listen, I'd, I'm not blaming foundations because that's what they do. They get product, auction it, and it raises, you know, for good cause. But it was like, you know, it did seem a lot that no one cared about the person trying to start their own business. Or, you know, when it comes to my background, being a veteran, you know, disabled veteran, 10, 11 years, starting my own business, everybody wanted free stuff. And I was like, what about the guys like me are out there getting out, you know, all over the military that's trying to start something, you know, support them. Um, so I've won. I mean, I just started saying no. Hmm. And then, you know, some of them that I was really close to with close buddies, I did what I could. And then I was doing like, you know, 50% off. And then some of those, you know, good, good guys who had those foundations, like, no, we want to, we want to pay full price. Because the knives are going for two or three times the full price anyway. Mm. You know, when they auction them or go to foundation events. So a lot of those, you know, people like, um, you know, whether Steel Future Foundation, stuff like that. And I, I'm in a position now, I don't want people to be like, oh, that's, you know, it's kind of messed up. But I'm in a position now when the business has grown that I'm able to support a lot more foundations and donate, you know, free stuff here and there. Um, but, you know... People like uh, Folds of Honor, they'll, you know, generally they're buying 50 knives a year, really beautiful customs. And they're like, no, we want to pay full price. So it, it comes back to the business, you know, like a little bit of profit on it. But you got to think of all the, I have half my guys are veterans. Right. You know, you, like take care of their businesses, buy two. Right. Know, don't ask for a discount. You know, and I do that. Like people, people hit me up and offer like, Hey, I want to send you some hats and shirts or, or something like that. I'm like, dude, chill. Like, how about this? Like I'll get on and I'll order stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that just doesn't just mean veteran owned businesses. Like these are just other small businesses in general. I'm um, like the other day, there's, there's a, a couple that's bought knives before and they have some businesses out East and, um, 
She makes sourdough bread, and actually, it reminds me, I'm another buddy in Northern California who makes sourdough bread, and a couple times a year, like, I'll see the Instagram pop up, and I'm like, cool, hey, can I order 35 loaves of sourdough, <laughs> and, uh, like, I don't care shipping, don't care the cost, like, you know, if he makes some money, I'm happy, and, you know, we'll get a bunch of boxes of sourdough here, and two days later, and hand a loaf of bread out to all the guys in the shop to eat that weekend, you know what I mean? It's, I, it's fun to be able to give that back and support those small businesses uh, you know, financially. I. There, there's a number of things here that I'm looking at that I see in other successful entrepreneurs. And if you're to try to distill it, um, you know, it's a passion for what you do. It's clear. It comes out in what you're doing here. Um, your, the office will often say, you know what, Trav, I, I know when, uh, I know who, who your friends are and who they aren't. Right. And I go, oh, yeah, how's that? Cause people will call up and they say, Hey, I'm Travis's friend and I'm looking for a discount. Right. <laughs> and, uh. And the office says, well, why don't you just call Travis, right? And yeah, they say, okay. I, I know your friends because they'll show up on the back end and they just, they just pay full price and they buy things. Yeah. I would yeah. give it to them for free, but they yeah, never ask of that, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I have a problem with that. I'm always like, oh man, like I don't, I don't, know, I don't deal with the money side of the business because I don't like that. It feels like I'm taking, you know what I mean? Right. I want to give so much. Right. You know, but I, I got some pit bulls here at work, you know, like Kelsey that runs the office here. She's a... She's like, no way. And she, I mean, to the point where we'll make a knife in the back or I'll make a knife and I'm like, oh, I'm going to keep this. And she's like, no, you're not. You're sorry. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, she's like, I'm the one who pays the bills. Like, oh, dang. Okay. Well, got to sell it, you know? But, um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I create discounts now that we're, you know, I didn't do, a, didn't really do a discount right in the beginning because I wanted my business to flourish. And the more mm -hmm. my businesses flourishes, I can do more for others. And one, one of my big things I've told guys, you know, Mac Belt, he's another team guy, really good guy. Um, you know, you know, the beginning he's like, man, I want to give any, he would like, send knives, like stop giving stuff away for free. Hmm. Like, listen, if someone's, you know, if someone's going to, you know, talk about you on a podcast or something like that and you want to hook them up. Okay. But like do one or two here, that's it. And if any of your buddies want discounts, that's not your buddy. I've said that. That's like, it. Listen, that's you know, it. <laughs> I should buy two. If, right. You know, I'm going to come to you and I'm going to buy two or I'm going to put an order in, you know, for 30 of them for my guys in the shop or. You know, I, I, that's how you support other businesses, whether, you know, it doesn't need to be a law enforcement, first responder, military, veteran owned business, just small business. Mm -hmm. You want people to succeed. We want our economy to succeed. We want America to, to succeed. You know what I mean? And those yeah. people want to create a business, something they enjoy and, and, uh, they got, you know, their kids mouths to feed and you can't eat ramen every day. So, <laughs> you know. I know my kids would like that. At least one of them would. True. <laughs> Loves his ramen. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And, but you're also surrounding yourself with people who, uh, compliment or they make up for your deficiencies. You're like, I, I don't want to deal with the money. I'll find someone, I'll find Kelsey. Right. Kelsey can deal with That's the money. That's like a good team. And some people are just better at some things than others. Mm -hmm. you know? oh, and right. you also give them the, the, you know, one of the things with, you know, that leadership is you're always learning leadership, but you're also seeing, you're empowering them and not micromanaging. So you're empowering them to get, be better at their job. And you're also saying, I got faith in you. Mm -hmm. You know, you're good at this. I expect a lot from you. You're going to get, you know, the better you do, the more you get paid and the more we flourish as a business. Um, but I do expect you to do your job well. And here's where I think you might be lacking. Here's what you missed. Um, I can't do what you do. I wouldn't, wouldn't enjoy what you do. So I want to give you the faith that you, you can do it well and grow in your own aspect. Uh, one of my coworkers at, um, he worked with me for a number of years and then moved on to another job and we've become good friends. Uh, and when he was uh, working with me, he says, uh, there's a Chinese, uh, curse that says, I wish you so much success that you have many employees. <laughs> and, uh, because the management of all of that, all of a sudden you're no longer right. dealing with what it was that you first started that you really loved. And now you're trying to deal with all these different personality yeah. types and, have you had difficult, I, I mean, Gary Vaynerchuk will say, don't get good at hiring, get good at firing, right? Just find a nice way where you can let somebody go who isn't working up to standard and assist right. them to get on to something that maybe another job or connection you have right. or what are your thoughts on, on those things? Uh, I mean, we, turnover would really suck for us because it takes a while to teach somebody, you know what I mean? So, and it takes away from the time of my, my guys who've been here a long time to teach somebody new. Mm. Um, so we don't like turnover, obviously. Mm. Um, it takes six months, seven, eight months for guys to get 
okay and then you know a good year year and a half or guys are ex- very proficient mm. and i do let the guys when guys hit a certain level here in the shop i let them get pretty damn creative on their own within yeah. reason and then guys really enjoy that you know and i want to see yeah. you know i could take five guys give them all the same knife design say these are the three handle materials you're each going to use and all the knives would end up different you know which is really cool that so is I want cool. guys to be creative in their own way and, and see where they're you know, they flourish, which I really like. What's your favorite knife for hunting? Um, I mean, I ran my Crow Junior probably more than anything else. Yeah. Uh, I used that little feather light a lot. When I was in Alaska, I used a, like a full-size Crow and a feather light pretty much for everything. And I took a, I took a Skinner with me, um, which I love those two new little Skinners. So it kind of depends. Um, you know, that feather light is a really killer little blade for almost everything it's just a little small for doing big big mm-hmm. game it's great for caping mm-hmm. for parts of big game obviously uh but you know i did a, I did a buffalo i must a buffalo with the skinner jr I did a oryx we've done obviously multiple elk with mm-hmm. my crow jr um there's multiple there's multiple knives Having the background of being able to look at a problem from a different angle, and I find perhaps that's an ADHD thing as well. You just, you look at something completely different than somebody else would. You didn't say you can't put padding under my shirt, right? Right. right. Um, massive benefit to having a business because you can find all the areas that need servicing that other people aren't because they just haven't looked at it yet. Sure. Or they learned a certain way and the way they learned, they only thought about it that way. Do you find there's people copying your style and like, or uh, just blatantly ripping off HFB? It's insane. Yeah. How do you protect uh, that? Can't. No? No. I mean, there's, there's obviously there's patents you can do like on a certain knife, a certain thing like the, you know, the wave, mm-hmm. uh, like Emerson did, like he can protect their certain patents uh, that people have like a certain thing, a certain design on a knife that does a certain thing. So you, that's, that's pretty much. All you can protect. Um, it, obviously, within the industry, like you're not supposed to copy people. That's that's a big no-no. Um, yeah. But you know, so what people do is they get really close with the design, and then they copy the handle almost exact. And and our aesthetics have been copied heavily last you know three years, mm. three years, four years, very heavily aesthetic copying. Um, you know, there's a level in which people are like, well, it's flattery, and I'm like, well, you know, there's a point where. It, it detracts, it does detract uh, right. from our business and what we did. And I didn't see any split materials like we did before. And we made that up. Mm. You know what I mean? Um, I'm I'm so stoked if we can be a good influence on other knife making. And I've had people that I look up to and look up to in the industry that are really incredible knife makers and bladesmiths that um, uh, are amazing and do incredible stuff. And, and we're all a bit different. Um, so seeing people that, they aren't original. Um, I'm like, you can be, <laughs> you know? but you know, does somebody want a real, you know, somebody you want a knockoff of something? No, mm-hmm. it doesn't hold value. So mm-hmm. plus it's challenging when people, you know, try to rip our stuff off. They're like, all right, well, what can we do better? What can we challenge ourselves to change or make new or, um, and just do better. I always wonder how much attention, because I'm a similar mindset. Someone wants a copy, that's great. I'll pivot. They're already behind me, right? They're already, but on the same breath, if you got something that's really popular that people are liking and it's going to devalue your brand in the way that they're trying to copy it because people start associating you with perhaps an inferior quality product, how much of your attention do you put towards protecting the brand as opposed to um, innovating and pivoting? Uh, minimal on the protecting the brand side because you can't, one, you can't do a lot. And two, we've built such a good, uh, loyal group of, um, of follow, good following. Um, you know, obviously it's a business, their product and who's behind the business. So we've built such a good, loyal group of people that know, uh, know the product and know us and have built personal relationships with us. So, Mm. excuse me. Yep. (coughs) It's on them to protect the brand as well. And we've had these conversations with, you know, HFB enthusiast group where somebody is, you know, rehandling, taking knives and rehandling them and trying to sell them and, and then, you know, contacted them and they'll be like, well, 
well, I, I'm letting the person know that I'm selling it to that I ha- rehandled it. And I was all, you know, taking a production knife, unbolting the handle and doing another handle on it. If you did, if it had their own style and totally different grip, hmm. I, I'd still think that's a little shady, like go out and yeah. be selling it. Like, yeah. like it's a, you know, they're always like, oh no, it's not a half face. I did the handle. Well, why are you selling as much as one of the <laughs> custom, our customs would be? Because right. you know someone, and here's the deal. Let's say the first person knows that, that person rehandled the knife, but it's a half face weight blade. Well, the second guy he may not sell that to because he wants to get fifteen hundred bucks for it, mm-hmm. or whatever, or you know. And then that guy gets a knife and he's like, "Well, this handle's kind of whack. This it's not lined up properly. This this is off. There's still scratches on it." Well, look at you know, look at now their first impression of a half face blade's knife. Right. So having this, you know, having these conversations with guys who have put a lot of money and invested a lot into half face and having these good conversations of like, listen, it behooves you to protect this brand because of your investment in it. Mm-hmm. And you want the knives to remain valuable forever or in gain in value. Mm-hmm. So be careful of letting, you know, or supporting other brands that are copying our stuff and knocking our stuff off. Because if it devalues our, you know, the half face in any way, it's devaluing your investment in this brand. So it's on everybody to protect a brand. That's such a good way of looking at it. But, you know, again, like I said, I don't spend a whole lot of time on it. Um, it's kind of, you know, like you're, people are going to do it and they know it's dishonest. Um, well, what you've done so, is you've made a very clear and concise way to help mobilize other people to spend time on it. Correct. That's brilliant. You know, you, well, why why do you need to put your attention there when it's going to take you off the eye your the prize that you're looking at? Correct. Just, that's uh, that's a, a valuable trait in a leader is to be able to oh, it's leadership, the art of influencing human behavior so as accomplish a mission in the manner so desired by the leader, right? But you can if you can distill that down and have others just pick up the slack and go with it. Right. Brilliant. Individual based, and we, you know, like I said, we built those good relationships, and we want to make the best stuff for people. And there's so many people who, have, who, have, you know, buy, sell, and trade, and they've made a lot of good money off of buying, selling, and trading. And I think they have gratitude as well, and we have so much gratitude for that that values the brand. So protecting it is a is a it's a protecting it's really big. Yeah, uh, I don't spend a whole lot of my my time on that my personal time, I expect people to have invested in, in the business and built these relationships with us here at the shop personally and the brand itself to, to do that. Where's that responsibility. The, where's the most of your time spent? Uh, I'm working on my own projects and, you know, working on up and coming collaborations and new designs and refining old stuff, um, and building those friendships, man. And, and, you know, spending time with my guys in the shop in and out of work. That's a ticket. I love it. Well, uh, should we wrap things up there? Is there anything else we should plug before we, before we do? Um, I mean, I guess we did talk about Warpaw a little bit. Just, I grew up up in Napa Valley and it's kind of my ode to, to, uh, the wine country. And I really want to do it for a long time. And I'd come up with some, you know, ideas and, and name stuff and what, you know, what I wanted to add into that. And I ran into a guy, uh, GW, Lucier. And he has his own wine, and he joined the army, and he got out, and married a, a woman up in Napa Valley that I knew, and became a winemaker, and has his own label, and he became my winemaker, and it kind of like just fell into place. And he's, I was talking to him, and he's like, "Yeah, I'm making wine. I have my own label." And I was like, "Hey, you know, would you consider, you know, managing and making wine with me?" And you know, I put my trust in him, and. Yeah, we go and find you know vineyards with good grapes and walk those vineyards and get those contracts and buy the barrels and and make wine. So that's small and it's growing. It's a cool side project. I really love. Um, if you get a chance, people can go there and there's only you know two uh, two varietals, two uh, wines up right now on the site, and then I have a Pinot Noir that's dropping in the fall. But read the back of the read the back of the bottle. People really like that. Yeah, the meanings, the symbols. There's, there's little symbols on the back, and each symbol stands for stands for something that I think people really jive with. Really cool. I have to check that out next time. It's been a few years. I've been the, in the Napa. The lion, the lion is one of the lo- little logos on the back as well. Very you know, cool. For, you know, the you know the lion provides and he protects his he protects his family and his tribe and he protects the land he grew up on. So, 
And it's warp on and they will they ship to Canada if I don't make it down to Napa? Uh, I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so either. Might have As to figure now, something out. You know, it's all I have it, you know, stored up at a spot in Napa Valley in a place called Vino Shipper ships it because they have the licensing for the different states. Okay. So it's all direct. Um there's you know, I just need to be really proactive with it with my limited time and um there's some really nice restaurants that have asked for it that just haven't been able to get it to them yet. Yeah, but I have my cab, cab will be two and a half more years till the Cabernet gets released. Um Pinot Noir will be this year, next year, another Chenin Blanc next year. I'm working with the guy Mario Scalati up there. He's got some really amazing wines, so working with him and I have some good mentors Very for cool. that side of the fence. I might have a couple connections in that area as well that might be able to assist with exposure. So we can talk. Uh, Always appreciate it. Talk off off air here. Um, Andrew, thank you so very much for being on the Silver Core podcast. Really enjoyed talking with you. Hey, did we not talk about our own project? We yeah, didn't, wait. did we? <laughs> let's, let's talk about that one. <laughs> right? Yeah. Oh, well, that's exciting. <laughs> yeah. how, how can I miss that one? Right. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we've got some uh, half face blades coming out with a uh, uh, special limited edition run. For Silvercore, yeah. and we're going to have, once those are up and ready, anybody who's uh, uh, interested in seeing that, we'll have links in the mailer and through social media, and you can check it out through uh, Half Face we'll Blades. So. We'll have uh, the, f- the first five done today. They're probably done right now. We're going nice. to get them up to you to start getting some uh, photography, and as the other ones get done, we'll get some photography and stuff down here. We'll get all the, the specs, and you know, we'll, we'll find a date and time where you want to release them, and We'll put that out. Uh, we'll put that out as well. Date, time, and images, and all the specs. And it's really cool. It's one of my favorite little blades. You know, outdoor blades. So. Mm-hmm. I'm so stoked for that one. It's um, yeah, and like it's been said a few times by yourself, but very grateful for the connections and being introduced to you and what you do. I'm sure we'll be talking more in the future. I'm actually looking forward to coming down and checking out your shop. Absolutely, man. And, Always uh, welcome. So we'll have all of that up on social media and of course your mailer as well. Andrew, thanks so much. Absolutely, man. It's been a pleasure to be here. It's, it's, uh, I'm glad we connected and we could work together and get to know each other. 